All right. Let's go through the thyroid hormone. So where is the thyroid hormone secreted from? Thyroid hormone is secreted from the follicles in the thyroid. It is the only steroid-like hormone that is going to be pre-stored, okay? Usually steroid hormones are going to be made on demand. However, thyroid hormone, yes, it has an intranuclear receptor, but remember that histology section of seeing the thyroid follicle? Thyroid hormone is the only uh, uh, steroid-like hormone that is pre-stored and not made on demand. Remember, these are the only steroid hormones that are pre-synthesized and stored. Do I know these slides or what? All right, so what is more secreted um, uh, form? What is the more secreted form? That is going to be T4, whereas the more active and the more potent form, that's going to be T3. What is the rate-limiting enzyme for thyroid synthesis? Rate-limiting enzyme of thyroid synthesis is thyroid peroxidase. You will never go wrong if you answer that. So thyroid peroxidase is going to catalyze the reactions for um, oxidation, organification, and coupling. What is oxidation? You take in iodide, that oxidation means iodide gets converted into iodine. What is organification? Organification catalyzed by thyroid peroxidase. Organification is taking that iodine and you are going to attach it onto what? Tyrosine residues, that's organification. And then when you put one iodine onto a tyrosine residue, that's called MIT. And when you put two iodine residues on a, thi uh, on a tyrosine residue, okay, when you put two iodines on a tyrosine residue, that's called DIT. So a MIT plus a DIT is equal to a T3, and a DIT plus a DIT is going to be related to a T4. Okay, and that's the coupling reaction. So what is the mechanism behind thyroid hormone increasing the metabolic rate? What does thyroid hormone do? It is going to increase sodium potassium ATPase activity. And what type of receptor does thyroid bind to? Thyroid is going to bind to an intracellular and intranuclear receptor. So let's keep going. We'll have what type of thyroid profile? If you are having oral contraceptive pills or a high estrogen state, you need to know that your thyroid profile is going to be an increase in total T4. However, you have a normal T, uh, free T3 and a normal free T4. And that's really important for you to know that OCPs and pregnancy increase your total T4 levels. The key point is that estrogen will increase thyroid binding globulin, increasing total T4, however, not affecting the free hormone. The free hormone is the only hormone that is important for the feedback regulation. Let's go through euthyroid sick syndrome. So the USMLE point is these patients will be sick. They'll be in the ICU, they'll have sepsis, cancer, some sort of cardiac disease, okay? That's euthyroid sick syndrome. So what are the laboratory abnormalities? They are going to be a decreased total serum T4 and T3, okay? with a normal serum TSH. See how wonky this is? A decreased total serum T4 and T3, however, normal serum TSH. However, you get increased amounts of reverse T3. What is this reverse T3 stuff, okay? So let me just make it kind of simple for you. Here is going to be T4, and T4 can be made into two things. T3, which is, hey, I'm really active, and something called reverse T3, which is metabolically inactive. There is an enzyme called 5 prime diiodinase that is going to take T4 and make it into T3. In states of illness, do you know what happens? Your body wants to conserve as much energy as, um, as possible. And so in your sick state, the T4, instead of going to T3, will become reverse T3. And that's the whole pathophysiology behind the increased reverse T3 in euthyroid sick syndrome. What is the mechanism behind reverse T3? Well, the enzyme is going to um, uh, make the uh, 5 diodinase enzyme is going to make it into reverse T3. And reverse T3 is biologically inactive. Hypothyroidism. Now let's go into the pathology of thyroid diseases. Hypothyroidism, patients present with weight gain, fatigue, and complaining of weakness. They have heavy periods and deepening of the voice. Now, what are their lipid profiles when we're talking about hypothyroidism? Well, their lipid profiles are going to be high LDL, okay? And that's really important. Hypothyroidism, you get a high amount of LDL, okay? A patient who has not seen a physician in 20 years, that's a long time, presents with altered mental status and dry skin. DTRs, what are DTRs? Yeah, deep tendon reflexes. Deep tendon reflexes are delayed. She has cool, yellowed skin, non-pinning edema in her face and extremities. Wow, this patient is really, really sick, right? What is going to be the likely diagnosis here? 
This is called myxedema coma. Myxedema coma, you have severe hypothyroidism and you get deposition of these mucopolysaccharides and that causes you to have this edematous type of presentation. Okay, and it's really important for you to know that you have increased amounts of GAGs and MPSs when you're talking about myxedema coma, the non-pitting edema. When you talk about hypothyroidism, here are your USMLE points. Another thing to keep in mind for hypothyroidism is a high yield psychiatry differential. What may be a likely DSM diagnosis that may mimic hypothyroidism? Depression, that's very important for you to know. Things slow down in hypothyroidism, right? Well, what if your mood slows down in hypothyroidism? Now, really important for you to recognize is how do I tell the difference between a depressed patient and a hypothyroid patient? I know right now you're like, oh, come on, Rahul, that's easy, right? On the USMLE, it'll be a little bit tricky because they'll have a lot of sicky caps and you'll be like, wait, the answer is hypothyroid? You'll get the NBME back and be like, what the F? So the key thing for you to realize is that depression can have fatigue, depressed mood, and weight gain, just like hypothyroidism. However, you tease them out because somatic symptoms like constipation, physical exam signs like decreased reflexes, these are not necessarily characteristic of depression. And that's how you tease that out on your USMLA, depression versus hypothyroidism. So the classic hypothyroid diagnosis is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And so what are the antibodies that are going to be positive for Hashimoto's thyroiditis? That is going to be antibodies to thyroid peroxidase. You're never going to go wrong with the thyroid if you say the word thyroid peroxidase. You can also get positive antimicrosomal antibodies. What will be the FNA? What is FNA? Fine needle aspiration. What is the FNA of the thyroid going to show in Hashimoto's disease? a lymphocytic infiltration with germinal centers along with Herthel cells. And this is basically sh telling you that Hashimoto's is all about inflammation and lymphocytic infiltration. Herthel cells are atrophic epithelial cells with eosinophilic metaplasia and prominent nucleoli, and that's a buzzword related to Hashimoto's. Let's go into Riedel's fibrosing thyroiditis. A patient presents with decreased energy and constipation. His exam shows fine hair and an increase in weight. His neck exam is non-tender and pertinent for an enlarged, firm neck mass. What is the likely diagnosis? Well, this is a painless nodule here in the neck, and that is going to be Riddell's fibrosing thyroiditis. So the thyroid essentially here is replaced by fibrous tissue with inflammatory infiltrate. It's a painless thyroid. Fibrosis may extend to local structures, and these local structures can include the trachea and the esophagus. And so this Riddell's fibrosing thyroiditis can mimic anaplastic carcinoma, which is a very malignant uh, thyroid cancer. Now that's a painless thyroid. What about a painful thyroid? Now we talk about subacute Dequervan's thyroiditis. Typically, patients are going to present with tremor and jaw pain after a viral URI. That preceding viral URI is characteristic in subacute de Quervain's thyroiditis. Labs are going to show high ESR and a tender thyroid. Patient is going to uh, have low T4 and T3 as well as increased amounts of TSH because it could be a hypothyroid um, uh, in the late phases. So what is the histology behind subacute de Quervain's thyroiditis? That is going to be neutrophil infiltration of colloid with giant cells. And this pathology can initially have hyperthyroidism after your viral URI that can inflame the thyroid and you can leak thyroid hormone. So you can be initially hyperthyroidism. However, eventually these patients can be hypothyroid. So when you have an inflamed, inflamed thyroid, what may be the radio iodide uptake show? The radio iodide uptake increased or decreased? it will be decreased because the thyroid hormone is so damn inflamed that it doesn't want you to take up the iodide that you give it. So let's talk about, about hyperthyroidism and how do we use the radio iodide uptake um, uh, to help us differentiate different patterns of hyperthyroidism. So when we talk about a patient who has hyperthyroid, we want to get a TSH and T4. True? Absolutely. We want to get a TSH and T4. Now, what if we have a low TSH and a high T4. When we have a low TSH and a high T4, we are going to be thinking about an uptake scan. That's what we want to do next because we're thinking of a thyroid abnormality. 
Now, if you have something like a normal TSH and a normal T4, think about psych disorders like panic attack that can mimic hyperthyroidism with tremors and shortness of breath. So now let's go down this pathway, talking about the patient who has a high T4 and a low TSH due to feedback. The uptake scan can be a couple things. If you have low uptake, you are going to be thinking of subacute decor veins thyroiditis, as well as, hey, I'm taking thyroid hormone because I want to look good on the beach, i.e factitious thyroid uh, 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 uptaking because of like some uh, secondary gain like weight loss. What about if your uptake scan is going to show a single hot nodule? That single hot nodule is called a toxic adenoma. It's going to uptake that really quickly and it's going to light up bright, bright, bright on your thyroid scan. What about if you have multiple hot nodules? Well, that's called toxic multinodular goiter. It's not rocket science. Now, the most important one is going to be if your uptake scan shows diffuse uptake. And that diffuse uptake on your, uh, on your thyroid scan, that's really important for Graves' disease, okay? And Graves' disease is ex exceptionally important when we're talking about hyperthyroidism. And guess what? We're going to cover it next. USMLE points for Graves' disease. Here's the nitty gritty of it. It is an IgG to the TSH receptor. However, this IgG, you know what it does? It stimulates the TSH receptor. Because if you stimulate the TSH receptor, you're going to have features of hyperthyroidism, okay? What physical exam findings are going to be pathognomonic for Graves' disease? Come on, guys. We need all of this right now. Exophthalmos. Keep those eyes open, okay? Mechanism of the exophthalmos, that's going to be proliferation of retroorbital fibroblasts causing an increase in glycose amino glycans, okay? And that's going to cause you to protrude out those eyes. What other physical exam findings is related to increased deposition of GAGs and mucopolysaccharides? Well, pretibial myxedema and uh, what we talked about before is the myxedema coma, okay? Very related pathologies. So what does FNA of the thyroid show in Graves' disease? Well, FNA is going to show a scalloped appearance of the colloid because the colloid is just going to be taken up, taken up, taken up, taken up, taken up because you have increased amounts of um, a thyroid hormone that is going to be synthesized and released. A female with weight loss, tremor, and has palpitations and occasional chest pain. What psychiatric disorder may be considered as part of your differential? I'm thinking about anxiety or a panic attack, exactly. Weight loss, tremor, palpitations, occasional chest pain. So typically, when you're thinking about hyperthyroidism, you can differentiate uh, hyperthyroidism and anxiety by this whole weight loss notion. Patients who are anxious, yes, they may have weight, um, weight loss, but typically on your USMLE, patients with anxiety, they don't have any weight loss. Whereas in hyperthyroidism, because you're increasing your basal metabolic rate, you're going to present with weight loss and these anxiety-like symptoms. So USMLE presentations besides Graves that we talked about, how about this one? Watch for the obese patient who takes thyroid hormones for weight loss. Patient on the test with hyperthyroidism can also present as atrial fibrillation. And this is hyperthyroidism that is going to cause you to have some sort of arrhythmia. So watch for the patient who has hyperthyroidism. And then what happens is, is that you get this AFib um, pattern and thyroid hormone can dysregulate the electrical activity of the heart. Thyroid papillary adenocarcinoma. So now we're transitioning into your oncological lesions of the thyroid, okay? So what is the most common thyroid cancer? It is the thyroid papillary adenocarcinoma. The fine needle aspiration is going to show high yield, empty nuclei with central clearing. Empty nuclei with central clearing is going to be the fine needle aspiration for thyroid papillary adenocarcinoma which is finger-like structures, thyroid papillary adenocarcinoma. What other histological characteristics may this tumor have? Well, this tumor, because it's a papillary structure, can have a somoma body, and we've integrated what are the different things that cause you to have, or what are the different pathologies that have a somoma body, and right there you see papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. Thyroid follicular carcinoma, that's going to be the next one. Thyroid follicular carcinoma, we need to really differentiate. What's the difference between a thyroid follicular adenoma and a thyroid follicular carcinoma? Doesn't carcinoma sound a little bit more scary? Well, it is capsular invasion. And remember that thyroid follicular carcinoma invades the thyro thyroid capsule because it's a more malignant thyroid tumor. Both pathologies can be non-functional, i.e. they're not going to affect too many hormones. But what is the characteristic metastatic pattern of follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. Follicular carcinoma of the thyroid is going to be very bloody, 
i.e. thyroid follicular carcinoma has a vascular invasion. So how I think of it is follicular, follicular, like V, like the F and the V kind of make me think of, okay, vascular invasion. And that's really important for you to know. Medullary thyroid carcinoma. A 22 year old man comes to the office with the thyroid nodule. He first noticed a small nodule on his lower neck six months earlier, and it has since enlarged. The physical exam reveals a three and a half centimeter thyroid nodule and mucosal neuromas of the lips and tongue. This is really weird. Patient's arm span is noted to exceed his height and he has long fingers. Levels of which hormone are likely to be elevated in this patient? So what are we thinking of here? This is very interesting because we are thinking of the MEN syndromes, exactly. And so calcitonin elevations are related to medullary thyroid carcinoma. And what are the his what histological cells are going to release calcitonin? That is going to be the parafollicular C cells. Parafollicular C cells are going to reduce, uh, release calcitonin.